Dak West is moving around. Watch it go. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer, and welcome to StatQuest. StatQuest is brought to you by the friendly folks in the genetics department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today we're going to be talking about how to do PCA and R. It's going to be clearly explained. Note, in the description below this video, I provided a link to the code that I use. So, if you want to do it yourself, all you got to do is follow that link, copy and paste, and you're good to go. Here's what we're going to be talking about. How to use the percomp function to do PCA. How to draw a PCA plot using base graphics and ggplot2. How to determine how much variation each principal component accounts for. And lastly, how to examine the loading scores to determine what variables have the largest effects on the graph. First, let's generate a fake data set that we can use in the demonstration. Note. If the details in this section don't make a whole lot of sense because we're talking about genes and read counts, don't worry too much. The important thing is that we have some data, and you might have your own data to work with. We will make a matrix of data with 10 samples where we measured 100 genes in each sample. This is where we name the samples. The first five samples will be WT, or wild type samples. The WT samples are normal, everyday samples. The last five samples will be KO, or knockout samples. These are samples that are missing a gene because we knocked it out. This is where we name the genes. Usually you'd have things like SOX9 and UTX, but since this is a fake data set, we have gene 1, gene 2, and dot 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 to gene 100. This is where we give the fake genes fake read counts. Sticklers for details will recognize that I'm using the Poisson distribution instead of the negative binomial distribution. Like I said, these are fake reads for fake genes, so don't worry about it too much. And here are the first six rows in our data matrix. Note, the samples are columns and the genes are rows. Now that we have our data, we call per comp to do the PCA on our data. The goal is to draw a graph that shows how the samples are related, or not related, to each other. Note, by default, percomp expects the samples to be rows and the genes to be columns. Since the samples in our data matrix are columns and the genes, variables, are rows, we have to transpose the matrix using the T function. If we don't transpose the matrix, we will ultimately get a graph that shows how the genes are related to each other, and this isn't what we want in this case. Percomp returns three things, X, SDEV, and rotation. I'll talk about all three things as we use them. We'll start with X. X contains the principal components, PCs, for drawing a graph. Here we are using the first two columns in X to draw a 2D plot that uses the first two principal components. Remember, since there are 10 samples, there are 10 principal components. The first principal component accounts for the most variation in the original data, the gene expression across all 10 samples. The second principal component accounts for the second most variation, and so on. To plot a 2D PCA graph, we usually use the first two principal components. However, sometimes we use principal component 2 and principal component 3. Here's our graph using the base graphics function plot. PC1 is on the x-axis because PC1 is the first column in x. PC2 is on the y-axis. It's the second column in x. Five of the samples are on one side of the graph and the other five samples are on the other side of the graph. To get a sense of how meaningful these clusters are, let's see how much variation in the original data principal component 1 accounts for. To do this, we use the square of SDEV, which stands for standard deviation, to calculate how much variation in the original data each principal component accounts for. Since the percentage of variation that each principal component accounts for is way more interesting than the actual value, 
we calculate the percentages. And plotting the percentages is easy with the bar plot function. Principal component 1 accounts for almost all of the variation in the data. This means that there is a big difference between these two clusters. We can use ggplot2 to make a fancy PCA plot that looks nice and also provides us with tons of information. First, format the data the way ggplot2 likes it. We make a data frame where one column has the sample IDs. Two columns are for the X and Y coordinates for each sample. Here's what the data frame looks like. We have one row per sample. Each row has a sample ID and XY coordinates for that sample. Here's the call to ggplot. I'll go through this one line at a time. But first, let's look at the graph it draws. The x-axis tells us what percentage of the variation in the original data that PC1 accounts for. The y-axis tells us what percentage of the variation in the original data that PC2 accounts for. Now the samples are labels, so we know which ones are on the left and the right. In the first part of our ggplot function call, we pass in the PCA.data data frame and tell ggplot which columns contain the X and Y coordinates and which column has the sample labels. Then we use geom text to tell ggplot to plot the labels rather than dots or some other shape. Then we use xlabe and ylabe to add X and Y axis labels. Here I'm using the paste function to combine the percentage of variation with some text to make the labels look nice. Calling theme BW makes the graph's background white. This is optional, but I prefer the way this looks. Lastly, we add a title to the graph using ggtitle. BAM! Lastly, let's look at how to use loading scores to determine which genes have the largest effect on where samples are plotted in the PCA plot. The per comp function calls the loading scores rotation. There are loading scores for each principal component. Here, I'm just going to look at the loading scores for principal component 1, since it accounts for 92% of the variation in the data. Genes, or variables, that push the samples to the left side of the graph will have large negative values, and genes, or variables, that push the samples to the right will have large positive values. Since we're interested in both sets of genes, or variables, we'll use the absolute value function to sort based on the number's magnitude rather than from high to low. Now we sort the magnitudes of the loading scores from high to low. Now we get the names for the top 10 genes with the largest loading score magnitudes. Lastly, we can see which of these genes have positive loading scores, these push the KO samples to the right side of the graph. And then we see which genes have negative loading scores. These push the wild type samples to the left side of the graph. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting stat quest. If you like this stat quest and want to see more of them, please subscribe. And if you have any suggestions for future stat quests, well, put them in the comments below. Until next time, quest on!